Hey everybody, this is Professor Beth RN from Dursing.com, and today I'm here to help you break down, understand, and strategize answering next-gen questions. While nursing school gives you a solid knowledge base, clinical judgment makes you the safe new RN when you're caring for patients. I'm here to help put your mind at ease with these unfamiliar question types so you can pass that NCLEX and ultimately start your dream career. Let's get started. Okay, so how do we know this is a bow tie question? This one is easy to spot, but not as easy to answer since it's going to incorporate all six steps of that nursing clinical judgment measurement model. So a bow tie question will typically give you a patient scenario with some information for you to recognize as normal cues, abnormal cues, complications, or other information. We have to read those column headers. It can also include a table that's going to have three columns with four to five rows in each column. And the trick is to choose that one correct answer from the center column. So if one question in the middle, I'm gonna start with that first. Then you'll have two correct answers on each side column, which kind of will draw the shape of a bow tie, which is why they call them uh, this shape. Since this is a visual question, let's get into one together. P.S. These are my personal favorite and probably one of the most challenging NCLEX question types. Okay, here's our bow tie setup. Can you see that bow tie shape? Perfect. One, let's read the question. So we have an ICU RN. They're caring for a patient who's 12 hours post-op from open heart. So we complete that patient's hourly INO, and then we evaluate an invasive hemodynamic catheter, a Swans-Gans catheter. And we notice a central venous pressure of 24 millimeters of mercury. So we're going to complete the diagram by dragging two expected findings, one potential condition, and two expected nursing interventions to complete the bow tie. So I can see that my headers are actually listed right in um, my directive here, but I can go down. So there's potential conditions and I need to focus on this. So it's always the center column first. Don't get confused by that. My side columns are actions to take versus parameters to monitor. And I'm literally going to be dragging these up to these empty boxes. So my options for potential conditions, since I'm starting, is having to know about what the question's asking me. So the question's obviously giving me some information and what it is is noticing a CVP of 24. So normally, um, CVP is a measurement of two to eight, and you have to have a basic understanding of hemodynamics. Now, this is usually a tough subject for most nursing students, but we have you covered at nursing.com with the hemodynamics course. So since our normal CVP is generally around two to eight, that is a measurement of preload. And since this CVP is 24, I know my patient is full of fluid. So because I know that, I'm immediately going to pick my center column as heart failure. Perfect. Now I'm going to go to my side columns. Actions to take. Well, if somebody has heart failure, probably not going to bolus them with normal saline. Ferrosamide, 40 milligrams IV push. A loop diuretic sounds fantastic. Let's get that fluid out of my heart failure patient. Great action. Raise the head of the bed. Love it. That's airway. Need to help my person breathe. Okay. I didn't even have to look at these two because I used my critical judgment to know these are great actions to take or interventions for a heart failure patient. Parameters to monitor. A heart failure patient, start at the top, crackles in the lungs. Absolutely. My fluid is going to back up from my heart into my lungs, especially in left-sided heart failure. Hypotension. Well, if think about it. If my patient's dehydrated, they would have hypotension. But if I'm full of fluid and an overload, I'm guessing my pressure would be high. Also, if I have a bunch of fluid on board, I'm assuming that I would not have diminished peripheral pulses. They would probably be three plus and bounding. Remember, this person's full of fluid. And because they are, I see jugular venous distension. Sounds like someone in fluid overload for sure. Pull that guy up here. Let's check it. Boom. I see that I scored five out of five. 
Remember, nursing.com always has rationales listed listed for you. You want to know why the correct answer was correct and why the wrong answer is wrong. Always remediate your rationales when you're doing practice questions. It'll only help you in a future NCLEX question. Okay, bow tie questions, how are they scored? So these type of questions use that usual zero out of one scoring rule. So you just saw me get out of five out of five, but if I missed one, you know, I would have had four out of five points. And so since there's five options for this one, it's partial points. We love them. We love partial points. Awesome. So just to review, what kind of question did we look at? We looked at the bow tie. It's my favorite. How do we answer these? Read the scenario first, and then make sure we read our column headers. We have to read the headers because the columns can have different headings. Okay, we need to start with the correct answer in the center. This will 100% help guide you to answer these questions correctly. And then the bow tie hits every single clinical judgment measurement. Read that question thoroughly. Take your time with these. Um, it can help spare you from rushing and missing something important and missing those partial points. You guys got this. Apply your nursing knowledge to these question item types Use the tips and tricks we discussed, and I'll help you answer your NCLEX questions accurately. Before you know it, you'll be celebrating passing all your tests, including your NCLEX. I can't wait to celebrate with you guys. If you want to learn more, come see us at nursing.com. We have more questions and practice for you. All right. And as always, happy nursing.